so much for joining us here for this uh, very special program tonight. Uh, we are going to be going through some really, really touching uh, topics uh, basically around the cope as we cope together uh, talking about grief and losses. Uh, our guest tonight this, this is none other than our clinical psychologist around the territory. He's been doing a great job himself and team. Uh, Dr. Michael Turnbull. But before I hand you over to Dr. Michael Turnbull for opening remarks, I must let you know that this is brought to you kind compliments of the Rotary Club Club of Tertola. Yesterday, we're the cap of the Rotary Club of Tertola, a family that has come together to reach out to you, who so many of us are going through such a challenging times. And so we want to make sure that, you know, we do our little bit to reach you in the place where you are, I should say, reach us, because we are all feeling this. Also, I want to thank uh, JTV Channel 55 has partnered with the Rotary Club of Tertola. 284 Media has also partnered with us, uh, Z King Radio and uh, Flow. We want to thank all these corporate entities for coming together for a moment like this. No other time that we need each other than now. Well, having said that, the big topic tonight coping together, grief and loss. Take us away, Dr. Turnbull. Hi, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm happy to be here and I'm happy to be really close to Artola and the fine people over there and President Smith and um, all the great uh, facilitators over there. We're glad to be here. And if you're here online, we want to make sure that you send your questions in. We'll try, I'll try my best to answer them so all of us can grieve together, heal together, um, it's a process, and we'll go through this process. We're going to be here for like an hour and change. So feel free to ask any questions uh, regarding hurt. It may be uh, passing regarding COVID-related, or it can be something else. So we really want you to feel free. I know it might be a little bit um, hesitant. And Kathy, you don't have to mention the person's name. No, definitely not. I'll ask the question. So it's going to be anonymous. You just you send in your question um, and we will uh, be able to answer them as best as we can. Um, but we want to be able to do this. Now, uh, as we start, um, I want everyone who's there, all of us in this territory at some point in our lives has experienced some form of loss a loss from Hurricane Irma, and now devastating human life loss, uh, 25 lives in the last three weeks uh, due to this pandemic. And we are grieving together. And in the midst of the pandemic, we have lost aunts, uncles, friends, cousins, other causes. And we are wondering where it's up from now and hurt is filling us. Uh, my children as well, uh, as you may be aware, uh, had their first encounter with death, where our friend, Aunt Tia, their nanny, uh, she passed on last week, week ago Friday, uh, to COVID. Um, and it's, 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 it's very, it hits home. I had a classmate that passed away, a dear friend um, from Carabae Teddy Bear. And everybody in the Virgin Islands is connected. We're interconnected. That's why grieving makes of so much difference. So we don't, we see the number 25, but it symbolizes so much more in our lives. So we're gonna go through some of the steps of grieving, but we want it to be as interactive as possible. And I'll pause at different points so we can be able to answer questions. We want us to be as authentic as possible. I'm gonna do this like we just do all our grief sessions as intimate and as poignant uh, but because of these great corporate citizens, Rotary Club of Tortola, it's free for all of us so we can continue to heal as a nation. On behalf of the Wellness Center Clinics, all the great team members here on the medical and behavioral health side, we are privileged to be a part. And I'm just here to represent all of the great, wonderful admin and doctors that represent our team here and all the other healthcare professionals within the British Virgin Islands that have been working really hard. So, Great. so we get a call, Kathy, and we are going through Facebook and we see a name pop up and it says, rest in peace. 
And we first thing we're looking at where, where first stage, as Eliza Kubara says, is denial. That's that shock and that awe. And these stages don't last a point in time. They go through different things. They don't just happen and happen in a succinct manner. They, they, they could happen. Um, you might find yourself going through them. So when you hear the five stages, don't think that they happen all in succinct order. Like when you get to the end, you'll never feel denial or you'll never feel anger. But the first one is denial. When you experience that denial, is that shock and that awe. You cannot believe what you're seeing. This could last hours, days, weeks. Um, and it takes a long time for you to make sense of it. As we've lost all our friends, our families, our mothers, our sisters, our brothers, our husbands, wives, how do we make sense of this? As recent as uh, moments ago, um, I was in shock again that I needed something done. My friend, uh, his nickname is Teddy Bear uh, from Carrot Bay, who has done all the tintings for me corporately and was there and I said, man, I need this stuff tinted and had to look at my phone and know I can't call him. And then the shock and the awe of, is this real exists? The hurt is, does this, does this exist? So if you're experiencing some form of denial still, it's okay. And you may ask, how do you get through this? We have to face it. And something you hear me saying through all of this, through, through this entire session is, don't rush it. We have to be, we have to be patient with what is happening with us. Um, you have to be patient. Grief is not something that we can rush. It's not something that we can just make go away. We have to be patient with our grief. Um, so the denial, the shock and the awe, you can't believe this has happened. You just talked to this person yesterday, they were good. This person had trips to do, like they had plans, and now they're here, and now they're not physically alive. That denial hurts. Uh, the second thing the second step is that anger. You just are angry. And that's something that we've seen in our community. And I don't, you know, when I, when people are seeing anger on Facebook and people are mad at different things, maybe the government, doctors, healthcare officials, they're mad at the pandemic, they're mad at the disease, they're mad at the virus. I don't want people to stop people from being angry. Anger is a secondary emotion. It's something that happens that causes you to be angry. And when we lose somebody we love, we realize it's the pain, the, the pain of that loss that grips us, that causes us to feel like life doesn't matter, that, that doesn't have any meaning, that, that pain, that emptiness, that void. And yes, our anger comes from that underlying feeling of loss and pain. And we have to admit that. We can't just be angry and spew that anger out on others. We have to be able to tell ourselves, listen, this person is gone. And the reason I'm angry is because, no, it hurts. It doesn't make sense. I wish this didn't happen. And when we're going feeling that pain, we have to find healthy ways to cope with it, but sometimes we have to be patient with ourselves that this anger and this pain, uh, you find yourself, you know, Kathy, just sucking your teeth like this. Yeah, and, and for, for a greater part, a lot of people tell themselves that, you know, there is no way out for this, for them. Uh, and so they, 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 they are locked in on that feeling of depression. But before we go any further, I, I think it's very fitting that we just have one brief moment of silence for those that we have, would have lost in this territory as of recent, not just only to COVID-19, but we would have lost so many other persons to other conditions. So let's just have just a brief moment of silence in their memory. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, Dr. Turnbull, 
I see you, I, I see you went to a place there for a moment. I know that you would have just switched from being in a session with persons uh, dealing on the, on the side of your job and to come here now to rush straight into another session of, of counseling. But I want you to, uh, as you take your deep breath in and out, I want you to talk to the many persons who, who feel that, you know, they don't need to share that that grief they are feeling and they tend to closet themselves a lot and in most cases we see those are persons who are destroyed and they, they don't need to be there so that's that's a great great point kathy so when you think about it when you have now that denial that anger that pain usually sometimes we just stop right there at that step we bury that pain that anger on the inside now, on, in psychology, is something we call psychosomatic uh, manifestations of symptomology, meaning that when you physically shut down your body from emotions, what happens is if you keep it long enough, you will develop physical symptoms because of emotional strain and stress and anxiety and depression, for example. And oftentimes you go to a doctor and the doctor will say, we've done all the tests. This back pain, this ulcer, this insomnia, this lack of sleep, this imbalance. No, you're not pregnant. What has happened is your period and your cycle is off because you are under a significant amount of stress, pain, and anxiety or, and or depression. Mm. And when you keep that in, what you now do is lower your immune system, which makes you more susceptible for physical illness. So oftentimes, sometimes we only see people come in to our offices after they've had a physical uh, thing that caused them to go to the doctor. They've had a migraine for two weeks. They have stomach ulcers. They have indigestion. They have back pain, knee pain, neck pain, shoulder pain. And when they get checked out, the doctor says nothing is wrong with you. But when they ask a little bit more questions, they realize that no, well, I've, I've been struggling. I lost a parent. I lost a friend. And when they say, well, how are you dealing with it? No, nah, I'll, I'll be okay. I don't want to talk about it. Mm -hmm. And that holding that in causes you to suffer and it comes out physically. Energy, uh, you know, the law of physics says it cannot be destroyed. It just moves from one form to another. Now, that means our body is an energy source. So if you shut down emotions, which is a pain, which is an energy source, it's just going to deposit itself physically. It's going to try to get out some way, shape, or form. That's why it's so important we're having this conversation, because this pandemic is causing a significant amount of stress that is not related to the virus, but it's... Exactly. Mm -hmm. If you think about it, yes, we have to take these measures, but we have people at home not working. We have people uh, trying to figure out homeschooling while they're going to work. We have people trying to see how we can get as much things done during the day before they have to go home. They're worried about being able to travel. They're worried about their health, well-being. They're worried if they should are going to be safe from this virus. And so if the amount of stress just keeps mounting. And think about it, Kathy. This stress is new stress because before this, they had their family stress, they had their job stress, they had their life stress, and then this just not compounds, so it becomes a volcano that's just mm -hmm. being added. But what we do is we put the cap on a volcano, but guess what happens? It explodes. It's just going to explode at a different end. So mm -hmm. we have the freedom to share an event, and now I know, right? We live in a community where people, Kathy, don't gossip, right? We do not gossip here beautiful virgin islands what we do, you're laughing Kathy. You know, right? I know we say melee yeah, we don't don't we pound melee we pound it out right and so that keeps people sadly trapped in their own pain mm. especially if you're grieving and you're grieving at a different rate somebody may have gotten be, being able to process their grief in a month but then some others may take three months, six months, a year. But because now they're saying, oh, you're not through that yet. You're not over that. What they do is that they act fine all day long 
and then come home, take care of the kids, take care of the family. And then when everyone goes to sleep, they cry themselves to sleep every single night because they don't have a safe place to process it. And then now the sleep deprivation, Kathy, mm -hmm. if you ask anyone, any psychologist, any psychiatrist, if you want to make someone emotionally and psychologically unstable, you deprive them of sleep. Men mm -hmm. on average get six, five to six, seven hours of sleep. Women desire a little bit more sleep, eight hours. Now, if you cut that by 50%, you're sleeping three to four hours. And sometimes that sleep is not, not, not rested sleep. Then you end up now being emotionally and psychologically vulnerable. You're more susceptible for anxiety and panic attacks. Mm. We have seen a significant uprise in panic attacks. Now, what does a panic attack mean? What does it look like when we just compress this anger, this pain? Is is that we are now? You may feel this, and it may happen. You get shortness of breath, right? You're trying to breathe, and you can't breathe. It feels like someone is sitting on your chest, and you can't breathe. You're, You've never had asthma before, but it feels like you're having an asthma attack. Then your, your throat, you can't swallow, your palms get sweaty, your net, your temperature is raising, you get beating headaches, you can't concentrate. Those, if they continue, are a symptomology of an anxiety disorder, which is manifesting itself in a panic attack and hopefully doesn't develop to a panic disorder because you are holding in too much. Mm. Ah, I want you to talk a little bit more, a little bit more on the the sleep disorder, not being able to sleep at night, because this is something that I'm hearing more and more from people within the, the territory. Would say tomorrow you come and you hear two, three persons saying, you know what, I just couldn't sleep last night. Uh, you would ask the question, so what it is that was on your mind and that would have caused you not to sleep? What is it that was happening to you throughout the day? And it's like, oh no, I think I'm fine, nothing. But yet, you just can't sleep. That says that something is bigger. Yes, that, that's a red flag. Consistent days of not being able to sleep at a regular pace, at a regular time, six to eight hours a night of sound sleep. It's a problem, it's a red flag. And if you continue in that past, you're, you're gonna be able and develop some symptomology that is gonna cause some ongoing problems in your life. So we really need to address it. We really need to make sure you pay attention to that. So sleep, yes, Kathy, is a significant symptom. Now, one of the ways that we wanna get into some solutions later, which I'll share, but one of the ways that you're able to solve your sleep deprivation problems is one, before you go to sleep, don't be on Facebook or social media. That wow. is not a good nighttime routine. I know I just messed up everybody. Oh, but it's not wow. a good nighttime routine. But if you think about it, um, when we are supposed to go to sleep, we're normally going to sleep with darkness, yes? When you mm -hmm. put a, a bright light in your face, that's indicating your body should stay awake. And the internet and social media is designed to keep your attention span. So it has different colors, brightness, variation. And for those that say, I can't go to sleep without a TV, I know that some people's routine that built that in, but in normal spheres, that's not a good routine. Now, one of the simple things to share with people, if you are able to have a notepad, the reason why I asked for a notepad and a dim light uh, before you go to sleep is you are able to, if you're overwhelmed about what you're worried about to do tomorrow, yes, we have a limited time frame outside, so you try to get as much done. You need to be able to, your brain is a machine a, a organism that wants to solve problems. It wants to get things fixed, and it won't let you go to sleep until it has an answer. We could simply trick our brain by being able to write down what is going on what we're going to do, what our plan is, or even say, I'm worried about this, I'm worried about that, I'm worried about this, I'm worried about that. And then that gives your brain permission to say, all right, we have a plan and we'll address it. It allows you to detox. Being able to do deep breathing, relaxation, uh, being able to, um, and essential oils of lavender uh, is great to help induce sleep. 
Um, so if you have a, uh, if you could put a little bit of lavender, uh, if you're able to have um, some tea with no caffeine, uh, that's always uh, great. And but if you're at, if you're struggling with your sleep at a significant level, you may want to see you know seek out professional help because that may be a bigger indication of something that needs to be addressed or talked out. Okay. Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, that's okay. And so let's let's talk a little bit about to that that person who would say to me, "Listen, I I really can't express what's in my head by writing." Would you recommend things like recording a voice note? Because most people have an electronic device that can record. But even if you cannot write, you can say it into your phone. If you, if you are able to express yourself verbally and record it, that's great. You want to be able, people may say, oh, you're going, you're going off or you're talking to yourself. But the thing about processing is being able to get what is on your mind out. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm worried about this. And when you're trying to do that before you go to sleep, don't try to figure it out at that moment. I'm worried about this. I'm going to do this. I have this plan. And you know what? I'm going to give myself tomorrow to handle it. Mm. Like let tomorrow take care of itself because you need to be able to decompress and come down at the end of the day. No, That's no, no. Why, why grieving in hard news when you get it late at night is so disruptive to our, uh, our equilibrium because we are not disrupting our circadian rhythm, meaning our sleep pattern to allow us to be able to go to sleep. So, we need to get a good sleep routine. What I tell people, try to get a great sleep routine that you stick to because we can train our bodies to know when it's time to go to sleep. Yes, that's not normal. So that's why grieving and understanding that you're grieving or going through pain or sadness and depression or all these things is being able to become aware that it's okay. You're not perfect. All of us are human beings. We touch, we feel, we hurt. That's where the bargaining comes in, where mm -hmm. the first step of grieving, Kathy, where we're saying, well, you know, I'll become a better person. I'll do this just if things go back to normal. We mm -hmm. just want things back to normal. I, I will change this. I'll act different. I'll treat my kids better if I can go back to normal. That's that's us trying to bargain between being okay and the pain. Oh, wow. And there, there's another scenario that, you know, very often times get uh, looked over, and that is dealing with grief and loss within a family setting, uh, especially in settings where we have children involved. And, and, and in many cases, we have the adult thinking that the child or children uh, are not a part fully in this process of grieving, and so they are left out of of discussions, they are left out of certain information that would help them not knowing that those kids are also attached just as evenly as much as, as you are. Yeah. yeah, Kathy, I'm gonna use myself and be transparent to allow others to heal because this is something, as we said, um, I don't even call her, um, we call her Hatia, uh, okay. Mr. Fo, um, who who passed on a week ago Friday. Um, and it was our children's first encounter with, with death, yeah? Mm -hmm. My wife and I, we found out Friday morning and we talked about it, when should we tell them? So we let them go through the entire day and we came together as a family. And I told them, I said, listen guys, um, you know, my soul, uh, you know, had COVID and she was fighting through. I'm going to try to get through this, Kathy. Mm. <laughs> and um, she she wasn't able to make it. And it's okay for us to be sad. And at that moment, Kathy, I started to cry. Uh, my 11-year-old said, Daddy, are you okay? I said, I'm sad. And she shook her head. She, she understood. My six-year-old twins... My son, Elijah, said that we have to stop him. He said, this is very sad, and he wants to go outside to pick some flowers to put on her grave. And my six-year-old daughter um, began to cry. She's very emotional, very emotionally sensitive. And 
my wife held her and, you know, we cried together as a family. Um, we told them if they have any questions about anything they can ask. Uh, my wife, she had to sleep with one of my daughters for a little bit, the youngest one. She was having nightmares about Miss Soul. They've known her since they were three years old. Uh, they don't know any, you know anyone else in that capacity. I've said all this to say, it's okay to for parents, for you to give your children access and permission to cry and grieve. When we shut it down, we're telling them not to be able to process this. We're telling them it's not okay. Mm. It's okay. We're, we're, we're hurting because we're sad because we've lost someone that we love and we don't make sense of it. So when your son, your daughter see you cry and you're able to express it and they're there, it helps the family to heal together. Yes, you may not have all the answers. Yes, you may not know the right things to say exactly. And me as a psychologist, I was that was the hardest thing that I had to do with my family thus far because that was my children's first real close encounter with death. We can't hide the grieving process from our kids. We break it down in very simple language that they can understand. We let them know um, what has happened. Sometimes, you, if you're able to, you can say the person has didn't make it and they understood because they were aware that they were sick before. And we have to put them in, in a grave, and they're able. They're gonna not. They're not gonna be physically here with us. Those are simple language, and as parents, we and siblings and aunts will know how best to to describe that uh, with them. But we want to be able to be honest with them and let them know where we are because trying to hide it won't give them permission to do so. It's not fair. Uh, beautifully said. Uh, the other thing comes down to uh, sometimes, you know, in, in a process of grieving, you need someone to turn to, to, to share what you are feeling verbally to talk with. Uh, and uh, sometimes you find a lot of people would uh, bottle up or closet themselves simply because they would often say, listen, I can't trust the person next to me or the person in my job area or the person that I think that I really should share with. And so they hold it. Where and when do you reach out to someone just so that you do not bottle up whatever you're feeling? Well, you have to, you have to look for the, the signs. If it's been six months, eight months, and you're still crying every night, hard to concentrate, difficulty sleeping, um, disturb, disruption your appetite may be a sign that you may need to, to ask for external help or professional help. We're um, mm -hmm. not supposed to go through life alone. Um, and when I um, take a break on next week from the practice, I'm going to reach out to my psychologist to talk, okay. process what's happening because I'm human. And so we have to be able to give people permission. But here's what happens, Kathy. Sometimes when people pass, when people go through stress, anxiety, depression, sometimes we say the wrong thing. Now, one thing I want to be able to tell someone if you're wanting to help someone go through grief is the difficult part about grieving, stress, and anxiety is silence. Being able to create what we call in psychology a holding environment where you hold the other person's emotions in an empathetic, non-judgmental way, in quiet. It causes you to feel full because the person is not depositing. So you're just there, supportive with, 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 with just your presence because you may not know what to say. Mm. And saying that the person has gone to a better place doesn't help because you're in pain. Saying that they suffer long enough doesn't help because that person is in, in grief. You have to let them come to their own acceptance as to what it means. And so sometimes just being there, silent, supportive, saying, I don't know what you're going through. Mm. Don't tell someone that you know what they're going through, but because you really don't. You know. Because your relationship with the other, that individual may be contrarily different to others. And so we have to be respective of that relationship 
that we have with each other. And so don't say you don't know, I know what you're going through. Don't compare your loss to theirs. Don't tell them it's going to be all right because we don't know if it's going to be all right. Mm. Just say, I am here to support you as best as I can. And I'll be here as best as I can. I don't know the pain, but whatever you're willing to share, however I can assist, I'll be here. And here's the important fact, Kathy. If you tell someone you're going to be there for them, be there. Please be there. Uh, you know what? Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Continue, uh, sorry. Uh, okay, yeah, so be there because mm -hmm. when you shut down, when you're not there, what happens is that person then now, now they'll shut down into a hole because they reached out and you said, well, you still, you still mad about that? That person wasn't good to you anyway. That's mm. not, that's not, not helpful. And often one of the things I say, we don't get over people. Mm. We learn to work through and we learn to live with our, our lungs. And that's the fourth step. Yeah, 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 you know, you know something that that struck me uh, today. I, I was on social media and I came across a comment where someone is obviously grieving, and the person wrote saying that you know every time I hear you have my condolences, uh, I give you my sympathy. I'm sorry for your loss. Though 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 they would have lost that person a significant time ago, it reopens a wound for them at what stage do we stop putting on social media on the people's posts or whatever have my condolences uh, uh my prayers with you because that person that that one really really struck me this morning well so for that person that posts that i definitely understand why someone is when someone says condolences when you see another r.i.p when you seeing someone is in a hospital, why it opens that wound. Kathy, I will say to you, we can't stop people from posting on Facebook. Mm. What we can do is limit our access to that. Mm. Because if we're not in a place that we know we're hurting and we know we have an open wound, we don't open it to anything and everything. We have mm. to be careful. It's almost like a baby that we can't let everyone touch it. You know, in the Caribbean, a new baby, you say, touch your foot, don't touch the baby face, right? Yes. Uh, so if, you're, if your grief is young, your anxiety, your pain, you need to protect it. You need to guard it. So people saying rest in peace and condolences is their way of being able to help you heal, but you may not be ready for that or receptive to that, and that's okay. Um, and it does open that wound, but that lets the person who's grieving know that they're still in the process of grieving and that's okay. Mm -hmm. That's the fourth step, Kathy, the depression. Mm. Fourth step of grieving is depression. Okay, the before I allow you to continue on the fourth step, I want to remind our viewing audience that you can drop your comments in, in the box below. Uh, let us know if you have any questions. If you do not want to put your comments public, uh, feel free to drop me a WhatsApp message on 340-4855. I say that number again, 340-4855. We will not reveal any names as such, but we we will relate the question and let's see if uh, Doc will be able to be of some help in whatever area. Even if you do not have a question, but you have a comment, a, a suggestion, a concern, uh, just feel free to let us know. So I, I put you back on that mode of depression, dealing with the topic of depression, Doc. And I, know, and I wanted to encourage, I, it only takes one person. You know, Kathy, I'll tell you, when, I, when we do grief sessions, we'll go through 30, 40 minutes with no one saying anything. And then uh, one person says something and then it opens and gives people permission. So if you're out there and you're able to ask a question, post a question, it will allow someone else to heal. It will allow someone else to have that freedom. Um, so uh, we will keep your name confidential or you may wanna ask your question openly. However you choose, um, we are here to help as best as you can. Um, and as we go along this process is the depression, the sadness. That's happy, the hard part that oftentimes we don't want to experience. 
when you talk about that cap when people shut down is that we don't want to cry anymore mm -hmm. but how that sadness and depression is not a clinical depression when you're talking about the grieving process it's not a clinical depression that you're diagnosed or prescribed medication it's a depressive episode where you may increase or lack of appetite lack of sleep difficulty concentrating um, you have that weight loss you have that sadness, irritability, difficulty concentrating, feeling guilty that you should have done something different, feeling worthless, like they should just take my life instead of theirs. Why me? You feel like the world is coming upon you. Now, that sadness is because of a void that has been created in your life because of that loss. Mm. And we express our sadness in very different ways. And we have to be okay with being able to do that. It's not easy. And at different times, it could be, Kathy, two weeks from now, three weeks from now, a month from now. And listen, I'm just going to say this so we can heal together. Mm. Christmas is going to be hard for all of us. All right? Let me just say it. Christmas is going to be hard for all of us. This is going to be the first Christmas that we are going to go through without these 25 plus people from COVID and the other countless lives that we've lost in the last month and a half. Mm. Thanksgiving. Mm. Some had graduations. Mm. Some people can have anniversaries without their spouse and be the first time being a widow or widower. Some people are not gonna now have to grow up in a single parent home because they've lost a, 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 a parent, cousin, breadwinner. Mm. So in December, November, here's why depression or depressive symptoms peak in holiday season and why grieving is hardest around Christmas time and New Year's because everything in the world is telling you to be happy, right? Yeah. Everybody's getting presents and everybody's happy. And then you're going home and seeing that empty chair, that empty bedroom. You're not going to get that call from that person to say, happy birthday, and Merry Christmas. And the sadness of your grief seems to come all the way full circle. Mm. That's why I say it's not linear. It happens in cycles. And you have mm. plans and you have trips and you're watching all these wonderful things happen in your family. And then what do you do? Where do you go? And it's, so it's difficult. So we have to be able to process our pain, our sadness, our depression in our own way. That's where we have to find healthy outlets, Kathy. Yeah. We have to talk to someone. We have to be able to exercise. We have to be able to be patient. We have to be able to write in our journal. We have to be able to form healthy relationships with people. It's hard, but it's necessary in terms of our healing. Because if we close our womb, right, and we close it up too fast, and it has a whole bunch of stuff in there, what's going to happen? You didn't clean it out. You didn't check it. But you wanted to close it so fast because it's it's hard. It's, you don't want to do it. And that whole hand now becomes infected. Mm -hmm. Imagine that being our lives. We don't want to process our sadness. We don't want to process our grief. We don't want to have patience with ourselves. So what happens? Our whole entire psychological makeup, which then goes into our physical manifestation, starts to be affected. So we're holding in. And then we have become different after the loss of a loved one. Of course, it's going to change you in some way, shape, or form. And that's where now, Kathy, in this step, we have to be patient, mm. patient with ourselves. And the more we try to fight against, I want to feel better, I don't want to hurt anymore, the longer our grieving process is going to take. Okay. And so I'm, I'm seeing here a comment from one person on the stream and they were saying, you know, you know, they feel as, as a country, we have not been able to heal 
properly yet from the devastation of hurricanes Irma and Maria and the floods uh, which happened in August prior. Uh, and now we're thrust with COVID-19, uh, which is causing even more hardship and uh, compounding that, but you over the, alluded to uh, having heap upon heap upon heap upon griefs that, that are coming on us as a community, because a lot of times we think that grieving has to do with a, a specific individual, but talk to us collectively as a community grieving together. That, that, that person, thank you for your comment. Um, you're exactly, exactly correct. When Hurricane Norman and Maria, we experienced grief and loss from physical things. And that, that is, you can't minimize that because grief and loss is loss. You lose a pet, a home, you have to be repatriated or leave your, your, your country. Uh, we saw it in, in St. Vincent recently with people having to leave uh, the Northern Red Zone and they're crying because they're home, that grief still grips you. So now we're just now, right, going along. September will be just four years after the devastation of September 6, 2017. And we're trying to pick some, and then boom, in 2020, in March, a pandemic is declared around the world. And life stops, economic stress again school stress, familial stress, being locked down, curfew, not knowing if you could travel, having to watch graduations and funerals from over Skype. And now, even now, now I mean to say this, Kathy, thank you for that comment. This is why we want you guys to interact with us. Yes. Because now we see the protocols for burial, right? Mm -hmm. We're so grateful for the creative people, for Dr. Storm and his team and the health professionals, at least trying to give the intimate family some level of closure to see the bodies. Mm. Imagine for all of us who are not intimate family, who are not close, are not in that included in that small number, who won't be able to see that person physically once more. All we have is a memory of that person. So now you have Irma where things are destroyed, then you have the physical death of the person, and then you have to now adjust how we normally grieve, and that adds another way of loss. So the, the closure that we are accustomed to, we have to do it in a different way. It's a mm. lot. It, it is a lot. And then added to that, we are in the heart of a hurricane season. And the experts here again says that this is going to be a very active hurricane season. So now your mind has to wrap around so many things I'm dealing with, uh, recovering, preparing myself in the event of a serious hurricane or storm or, or flooding. I am coping with the death of, of close relatives or just a friend or just someone I know. Mm -hmm. And then I am still thinking about whether my roof is going to stand up. Yeah, so now <laughs> what we call this in, in psychology, and not to minimize it, we are experiencing multiple traumas. Hmm. Trauma of hurricanes, trauma of a pandemic, trauma of a hurricane season, where we don't quite meet, some of us may meet the uh, criteria for anxiety disorder, and specifically post-traumatic stress disorder, where we have a re-triggering. Every time we see something coming off the border, we're like, what is this? Last evening, the thunder, the lightning, we have brought back palpitations, headaches for people because we have trauma on top of trauma, which all falls on the anxiety, yeah? Mm -hmm. All falls on the emotional disturbance, which now our body is now faced to react with. And if we don't find healthy ways to cope, we could succumb. If you remember after Hurricane Irma's, we, we had uh, five people sadly lose their lives. Yes. During the month, three or five. Yes. But then after subsequently, the high correlation, almost 200 deaths post a year and a half because of the stress of rebuilding. Mm -hmm. We had symptomologies, cancers, heart attacks, and all of these that were exacerbated because of the stress of mm -hmm. trying to fail and now we're seeing the same thing because of this pandemic. We have uh, uh, secondary stress 
as a result of this primary pandemic. So we really have to pay attention to ourselves and we really have to be able to learn how to cope together and be able to give ourselves some slack, find healthy ways to be able to take care of ourselves. Mm. I, I touch a little bit on uh, what in my mind I would, would want to caption as a self-induced stress uh, and reason for grief and all of this. I, I, I remember the situation uh, when we had the previous lockdowns, when so many persons were exhibiting uh, levels of anger because they, they felt that we were trusted in a period of lockdown simply because there were too many people being smuggled in and this and that. And so people started to throw anger at an unseen force. In many instances, you do not know who or, or what was involved, but you were now ex exhibiting a high level of stress and anger because of a situation. And in my mind, I, I am taking that as self-induced. Well, let's say not only self-induced, sometimes we do things that are just not helpful, but not to blame them. When you are in pain, you try to, we want to relieve pain. So some people may drink excessively. Some people may quarrel and make bad decisions. Some people may spend um, um, inappropriately. You know, we do things to just try to make ourselves feel better. And we have to know that we have to make wise choices. Yes. We understand your pain. Yes, we understand you're hurting, but we don't want to double down on it. Let's try not to add more things to our pain. Let's try to be wise about our decisions. But I understand why you don't know what's up, because every time you try to do something positive, you're slammed back in the face and negativity hits you again. So I understand why it's not easy, but it's necessary not to be our own worst enemy. So mm -hmm. if you're going through depression, stop talking negatively to yourself. Stop telling yourself, or you weren't good enough, or they, this person left you because you weren't right to them, or you should have done something different. You're blaming yourself. Uh, and, and on top of that pain, you're saying, well, we'll never get better. Or something you say, we deserve to be in this position. Those negative thoughts keep our sadness and anxiety alive. They're negative automatic thoughts that I will never get better. This will never get better. We'll never do any better. That's where hope and positive thinking has to come in. That we have to be able to think beyond our current stress, our current grief. And that's not forgetting about those we have lost, but it's being able to know that yes, this last stage, Kathy, is acceptance. Mm. We think that acceptance means that we're forgetting about those we have lost. And it's far from it. We're not forgetting those we have lost. What we're doing is making sure that we're saying, I accept whenever you can, and this is no rush, that this person is not physically in our lives anymore, that I can't physically touch them. I accept that. But I also accept that I could create a new life with their memory in my heart, with their picture, that I could honor them in my own way. And that's something that collectively as a community uh, that we can do. And I know we're gonna do it with the globe, great people here, that we're gonna have memorials, plant trees for those that we have lost. So we never forget their names. Mm. And we don't want to be ashamed to not call the people that we love. Like Miss Soul, who, who, who I lost, great friend. Teddy Bear, yeah. <laughs> right? if, if I could keep my tints on my car, uh, I'll keep them there forever. Clyde, my classmate. Um, if, if I could go and sing karaoke, and if, if I could remember all the great trips we took together, I'm gonna remember that because we need, how you're able to balance your pain is to be aware of your pain, right? But also aware of the great times as well. Yes. If you have a negative thought and that pain grips you so much, it's okay to balance that off with a positive memory. Yes. So yes, you have lost your mom and it hurts and your friend or your husband or your cousin. And 
You don't know how you're going to live without them. But here's what. That's the reality, and I accept it. Mm. That doesn't exist. But here's the other reality. I had some great times. You smell a cologne, you're like, boy, they used to wear that cologne. <laughs> or, or you go to a place, you get a little sad because you spent time there with them. Yes, that's acknowledging that you wish they were here. But you could also reflect on the great times you had there. That allows you to now be in balance. Allows you to find a great place that you can continue to live and honor. So acceptance is not forgetting. Acceptance is saying, I acknowledge that this person is not physically here with me, but there are simple ways that I can continue to honor them, celebrate them, love them through my pain. Mm. Uh, and another thing, if you can, if you can shed a little light on this and how it goes, I know this one would would point to me directly. I often say to my family and my loved ones around me, when I die, I want to be flat in the earth. You just level it off. Don't build nothing over me. Don't come back uh, year after year to that spot to say that you're talking to me. Just remember that I am there with you. Always the memory of me lives on. I do not need that. But then just recently I said that to someone when they said to me, oh, um, so tomorrow they're going out to, uh, you know, to, to paint or do over grannies and tombs. And, you know, I couldn't sleep that night after realizing rather than, than me being a little more sympathetic and comforting to that person because that meant a lot to, to them, obviously, that they are not there with their families to go through that process. And what I could say is that, you know, just dead and gone, uh, think about the fun memories and, and being there is not, is not so necessary. I wanted so to be myself the next day of that. Well, see, the thing is, it's a process, yes, because as we learn and we evolve, we understand that the way you may want to be remembered is not helpful to everyone else. Mm -hmm. So as we have loved ones, we try to honor the dead and what they wanted, but there has to be a balance. Because being able to go and put flowers is a continual process, not only honoring, but being able to grieve. Remember, mm -hmm. it doesn't have a timeline. Time frame. Just manifest in different iterations through our lives. So you may have a t-shirt on that you always wear with somebody who's passed. That's your way of honoring them. And we can't take that away. You may want to name a son or a grandson after the person that, that you lost. And that's your way of honoring. You may plant a tree or name a center or create a fund or a charity in their name. That's your way of honoring them. And we can't take that away because it's not saying, well, that person is not over them. No, that's how they're working out their grief. And so we have to be respected. And one thing, different things, when you said that, well, when they did that, it brought up some memories for you. Well, that means that your grandmother still has a significant part and, and meaning to you. And that's okay. Your way of remembering her may be different, mm -hmm. and that lack of sleep shows that recurrence and resurgence of those emotions. But all you have to do is say it's okay, because it just shows that this person me meant a lot to me, that I love them, and it still hurts ten, five, eight years later that they no longer here. And we have to be able to tell ourselves that's okay. I'm mm -hmm. I lost someone I love. Mm -hmm. uh, this, 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 this part that I'm going to go to, it's, it's very sensitive, but I think if we do not speak about it, uh, it can prolong. Mm -hmm. And I wish to see the day that this, uh, this just stop and we move on. Very often during these past two weeks, what I've been hearing a lot of persons saying, oh, if they had gotten vaccinated, we would not have been in this situation. If they had gotten vaccinated, uh, they might not have died. And uh, that blame game is thrown there and it's causing grief. I'm seeing people in, 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 in really bad shape of anger, hurt, depression, because they are throwing a blame on a situation or a person. 
So let's just say, Kathy, that's no different than what we do normally, right? Let's think about it. Let's take away the vaccine and COVID for a moment. When someone goes out to a party and they say they died at the party through violence, I told them don't go there. I told them to stop hanging out with those friends. I told them it should have been different. Or someone takes a trip. I told them don't take that trip. Or someone tries to do a surgery. I told them don't do this. Oftentimes, we need to realize that we are now in pain and that anger is a manifestation of our grief, but it's unidentified. Also, we need to understand it is not fair. Whether someone was vaccinated or not does not qualify or disqualify the tears, the pain, and the hurt that that family member is experiencing. You know what? That person has passed and it hurts. Regardless of how we try to bargain, see that's bargaining, right? Mm. At the end of the day, when we lay our family members, our friends and loved ones in the ground, you can't say, oh, I wish they were vaccinated or not. Yes, do we want people around us? Do we want people to make choices in their well-being? We all do, regardless if it's a young man who lost his life on a scooter and he said, I told him to not drive these scooters. You're mad at the scooter. You're not mad at the scooter. You're mad and hurt because the person is lost. You're not mad at the vaccinations and or not. You're mad that this person is gone. Now the reason you could debate after, but it's not fair to have that included in your grief. Or if that's some way that you're grieving, don't put it on the family member or someone else. Don't say, if this person was vaccinated, it would be alive. That's unfair because that mother, that family is hurting. Mm -hmm. Yes, we will want everyone that we've lost to be alive, but that's not the reality. And we have to be able to sit with where we are and know it's very grieving, it hurts, and not try to justify someone's life based on a choice. It doesn't help you grieve anymore because the reality of it is the person is not here and it hurts and, and, and the pain is real. So don't let, let's not do that. Let's not, those are one of the things uh, is if Elizabeth Kubler Ross is here developing this right now, we'll say, don't say that to a loved one. Don't say that to a loved one. It's not fair. It doesn't help. The, rea we, the reality is that a person has passed. The circumstances by which they have passed may make us angry. Right now is the vaccine talk or not. Some people may be in the hospital. Some people may blame healthcare workers. Some people may blame that the borders. Some people may blame tourists. Some people may blame a lab somewhere or what what theory they have or why this virus is here. Just know that's your way of your anger, and that's the second stage of grieving: your anger and your bargaining. So now you put it in a place that you're on your way grieving, but just know don't put your process of grieving on someone else. And right. don't tell someone to stop grieving because of a choice that they made. The person that's sad, this reality is they're sad, they lost someone they love, and that's the bottom line. Okay. And the reality of it makes it very difficult. Uh, beautifully said, um, uh, and uh, that also answers uh, this 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 question that we had from one person uh, who was asking that we speak a little bit about anger. Uh, some people are really angry right now. How can we cope when we find ourselves uh, just getting angry at everyone and everything? Yes, so uh, great, great question. Be angry, being angry with everyone and everything when you're in an anxiety, depression, or grieving, is a normal reaction. Now, what you have to realize, if you're finding yourself so angry for a long period of time, you find a week, two weeks have passed, you need to really address it. But if you find yourself angry, you need to take a step back. And that's, that's something that's hard because we're in a community where we feel like we have to keep going. We have to just keep, be okay. And taking a break, asking for a day, two days off work, or maybe a week, may seem like a form of weakness. 
But if you keep going on that road and keeping that can on the road with that anger, you're going to explode. And then you start, your anger starts coming on your family members and the people closest to you, which causes you to not be isolated because you're now hurting the people that want to love you. So if you find yourself being angry, it's a red flag for you to stop, especially if that's not your personality, and address the deeper meaning. Remember, anger is a secondary emotion. We are angry because we're ashamed. We're angry because we're guilty. We're angry because we're in pain. We're angry because we feel left out. Those, so we need to find out what's making us angry, and if we have the ability to address it, Address the source of our anger, not the symptoms. Okay, great. And I want to share with you uh, another comment here. Uh, this person said, I had to deal with my mother's death a week after Irma. The stress of standing in line for everything and is still a six-month-old on my, on my shoulder and my job underwater, literally. I don't know how, I, how do I do this. How do I do this day? Right. Probably a little error there. I only got to grieve her months after when everything is simmered down. Yes. That's why I'm saying grief is a process. And so, for example, right now in the territory, we're now holding a bated breath mm. that we've gone at least 72 hours, uh, almost going approaching a week or most, and I want to be wrong with out of COVID related death, for example, mm. and hoping that continues. However, we are kind of like, do we start grieving now? Because we don't know when we're going to have to start the process all over again. Because we haven't been able to really stop and grieve right now in this pandemic. Because so much things are happening, our grief may be delayed. So that's what I'm saying. If September, October, you find yourself now going through all these symptoms that we are now talking about. Remember, your grief didn't start because your body was in survival mode. Mm. You are very, very adapt. We will adapt so we can survive. So if you have to survive, if you can't stop, I understand. Because everyone doesn't have the luxury. But when you have moments to grieve, grieve. When you can be, when you can cry, when you can express yourself, but sometimes you don't have this space for that, that, that person that commented that with that six-year-old after Irma, I mean. Six months old, baby. Mm -hmm. There's no time to, to sit there and cry a month after, uh, just days after Irma, you have to bury your mom. Loss on top of loss. Stand in line because you still have to eat, you still have to get gas. That six-month-old is still depending on you. And many of us right now, are in this situation. And for that person to be able to comment that shows a hopeful story. Mm -hmm. You don't have to rush your grief, but in time, you'll be able to live through it and become stronger. So even them being able to type that shows their level of strength and gives hope to us now who are currently in the midst of grieving that in time, over time, we become stronger, we become wiser, but we don't have to rush ourselves. Don't rush your grieving. Mm. Take your time. There'll be moments that some days will be easy. Some days will be harder than others. And that's okay. The patience to be able to be present and settled is okay. Okay. And I know we're coming down to the final minutes of, of this uh, so important discourse. And, uh, you know, uh, persons are now beginning to, to throw in a few comments here. I see mm -hmm. someone says, um, some people just lack compassion. That's true. I don't, I can't, no if, ands, or both. Some people just don't know what to say. Mm. And so instead of us trying to justify our grief to others, we need to create distance. You mean to say to this person, listen, I don't hate you. I have nothing against you. But right now, you're not helpful in my life, and I have to create some distance. Okay. Put some healthy boundaries in place. Because if you let the wrong people into your life and your grief, they will come into your life and make a mockery mess and cause more pain. So we have to be able to say no, put some boundaries, 
exit some WhatsApp groups, take a social media break, take a WhatsApp break, maybe take a break for some circles and some friends because they're not helpful. Mm. They don't know what to say. They're callous. They're using a moment when you are down and vulnerable to prey upon you. I wish that everyone was kind and supportive, but Kathy, that is not the reality. That's the reality now. Mm. Some people are just mean. Mm. Our realization and acceptance that some people are hurtful, we need to now make provisions to preserve ourselves and our families from those types of environments. So we create boundaries by access. You don't change who you are. When you realize that someone is hurting you or not meaning well for you, and especially you and your last straw, this is what people don't understand. That people now who are grieving, who've lost family members who are breadwinners, who have to go to sleep at night by themselves, still have to wake up and go to a job, have hours cut, are struggling to put food on the table, trying to make sense of this curfew, have kids at home by themselves. People are holding on with a thread. When people seem to be popping off or going off or losing their minds, it's not because they're weak, it's because they're really having a difficult time. So the last thing that we need to do is judge that person. Let's show some BVI compassion, some love, some empathy, that I don't know what it is for you to go through what you're going through, but I can be kind. Mm. Let's go back to the place where we're checking on people, where we're feeding others, where we're being our brother's keeper, our sister's keeper, where we're saying, I don't know what you're going through, where we're going to let that person in traffic and not curse them, where we're going to check on, make sure, because life is so vulnerable. So let's be kinder. And for those yeah. that just can't be kind, we don't change who we are. I'm not going to not be a nice person, but I'm not going to give you the same access anymore. Mm -hmm. Because you have been proving yourself untrustworthy of the access in my life. So I'm going to create some healthy boundaries with you. No, I, I can't do this right now. Or I need a moment. You can tell when someone is having a difficult time when you says, I need to think about it. If you're grieving, anxious, up to it, and you say someone asks you to do something, and you said, I need a moment, and that person pops off at you, red flag. That person is not empathetic, and you need to create some space. Great, great. And uh, Doc, I think uh, people are now getting into their homes because of the seven o'clock uh, yes. curfew. And so now we're getting a few more questions popping in, uh, but we have a, a time limit of 7.15. So we'll try to push those in quickly. I have one more here right now. Uh, how, to how to approach someone who is grieving for the loss of their mother, but has shut up shut everyone who is close to them down? Yes, okay. great question, because that is a reality. You have to be persistent and patient. Whether that person shut everyone down, you may send a message and they may not respond. You may drop something by their house and they don't wanna talk. You may give them a hug or tell them, come out, let's do something, and they don't want to come. Just be consistent, patient, and supportive. They're going to read the message eventually. They're going to come by eventually. And here's what you continually do. Tell them, I just want, I don't know what you're going through. I just want to be here when you're ready. However, if that's now gone on a month, two months, you may need some professional intervention because now that person is probably going into a depressive cycle that will need some professional intervention. But if it's a week, two weeks, maybe a little bit longer, just be consistent and supportive. They'll come around eventually. Just if you say you go by their house and they invite you into their house, don't feel like they're going to talk. They may not talk. You just sit there and just be present and supportive. Now, if that person has totally shut you out, blocked you, don't want to talk to you, don't want to talk to any family member, you may want to keep bringing a group of friends around and keep doing your best to support them. Or you could give them a number for a professional so they could say, here's a number, here's help. And if you may want to reach out to someone, but if it hasn't been a long time, 
And remember, time is relative in terms of grief. If it's a week, two weeks, you may just want to just say, let me, let me be a little bit patient. Let me, let me say, let me uh, be, be kinder to this person. Let me wait. Let me give them some time. So one of the things I often say for people who are difficult and get shut out, send them a message. Say, listen, I can't imagine what you're going through. This was your mom. You only get one. And you tell them, I want to be there for you. I don't know how. But please, don't shut the door on those who love you. I can't love you like your mom, but I want to be there for you. Just be genuine, authentic, and patient. But also be consistent. Don't get too fed up. Don't get angry because that will just justify them shutting you out. Mm. So be persistent, consistent, empathetic. And if it seems like you're not getting through and you're worried about that person's physical and emotional well-being, that you're worried that they are not being well, then you may want to reach out for some professional intervention as well. Okay. And so uh, someone is uh, messaging me here privately. And the, the essence of the question is, uh, when does confidentiality shift? to a stage of shared confidentiality, giving an example that, you know, they may know someone who is grieving, is closeted, and they are seeing that the situation is destroying them, but they do not want to come out of that closet, but they have confided their information with me. And I am of the opinion, strong opinion, because I'm seeing what's happening to them, that they need help that I cannot give them. So when does confidentiality shift to shared confidentiality. Oh so, yes. So in those moments, it's very difficult, especially as a friend and you have access to them, you see them deteriorating week after week, month after month. Because in psychology, we break confidentiality on three circumstances. One, if there's abuse to a child, sexual or physical. If you have a court order and the judge orders uh, records because of a criminal matter, or if you intend to do harm to yourself or others, we have the right. Now, if you feel that that person is doing harm to themselves or maybe doing harm to others, you have a duty, not a psychological duty as myself as a professional to report, but as a duty as a friend to try to get some help outside of yourself because that person is deteriorating and not be maybe thinking in a coherent manner. So you may need to intervene especially that person is not eating as right. They're losing as copious amounts of weight. They're, they have to use all their sick days, all their vacation days. They're not really taking care of their yard. You've seen that change in their whole physical appearance and not taking baths as much. Yeah, we need to intervene uh, before it gets too late. Okay, and I think this will be our final question because we don't want to uh, go too much past our time. I know you would have had a long day. Uh, mm -hmm. This one, it's a one that's come in privately. How healing is I'm sorry? Yeah. Yeah. So that ended um, right. Saying I'm sorry is what are you sorry for? Um, I'm sorry for your loss, is what oftentimes people say. And yes, that's I'm sorry for your loss. It makes it hard because it reminds you of your pain. And when someone says, I'm sorry for their loss, you can't take that away because they might not know anything else to say. And when they say that, it brings back that you have lost someone. And if you're immediately, you're grieving weeks, months removed, then that comes as a reality of, man, I'm still going through this. That's okay. Because they may genuinely be sorry and they don't know what else to say. But how healing, it's sometimes the best we can say. But what I, what I want to tell someone when they're trying to find the right words, and you could go um, to a website, grief.com, or uh, and look up Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, and there's a free website resource. They have a whole list of things to say and things not to say. Um, and we want to be able to say, you know, like, whatever you do say, be genuine, empathetic, and thoughtful. Would you want someone to say this to you if you were in their shoes? Use that litmus test. So if you just see someone on the street 
And I do this sometimes, Kathy. I see someone in the street, I know just lost someone, and I just do this, you know, because I don't know what to say. And if I start to talk to them, we might not have the time for them to unpack their emotions. So just be present, just be honorable. And the words you say, just check in with yourself. Is this going to be helpful? Don't you see, when we see someone grieving, we get this anxiety and feel the need to say something. So we're saying it out of our anxiety and that's not helpful. So we have to learn to be silent, present and available. And that's sometimes more helpful because that grieving person, remember you are on my right, you are on my left. And you were there. You didn't say much, but you were there. You brought that plate of food. You, you brought that flowers. You picked my kids up when I couldn't. You cut my grass. You painted my house. You Those are the things that action of love and support are sometimes more tangible and meaningful for the words. Because you don't have the words and the person grieving doesn't have the words. And oftentimes that's why it's manifested in our tears. Okay, great. Uh, this was a great, great forum of what we want to cap a group session where we can talk uh, widely uh, to our people around the world and more than important, uh, the people here in the British Virgin Islands, because we know what we are going through as a people, uh, especially in this season when we would have lost uh, 20 odd people in less than one month. It's it's unprecedented, okay. but it's here and we have to deal it, with it. And forums like these uh, are what, uh, the, those are what we need in order to get through this together. So I wanna thank you so much, uh, Dr. Mike, uh, for those who may need to reach out to, to you and others who are available in, to, in the territory for the professional help that they think that they need, how can they do that? And where can they find you? As, as you know, we are here at the Wellness Center located at Tortola Pier Park. Uh, we have uh, four psychologists on our team, a psychiatrist, and we have an educational um, mental health consultant that goes into the schools. Uh, we are here, we have also a medical clinic, our, uh, Dr. Lewis, who is able to manage um, our health and long-term health. So we're here to help and make a difference. We want everyone to live well. You can contact us at 496. 0838 or 442 help, 442 help. In addition, you have community mental health at the hospital where you're able to access help there. You have support lines that have been going around. We want you to reach out, reach out. Don't suffer in silence. We're all in this together. I wanna to thank you, Kathy and the Rotary Club of Tortola, of all the media houses, the sponsors for allowing us to be here. As I say in these closing words, it's a, it's a hard time. And we have to stop acting like we have it all together because we don't. We don't know when this is gonna end. Mm -hmm. We're human and the transparency of our emotions is okay. Remember grief happens in five stages. You have the denial, the anger, the bargaining, the depression and the acceptance that this person is no longer physically with us, but we can live on. And BVI, we can live on together, stronger, wiser, and honor the memory of those we lost. Celebrate their lives. Let's call their names. Let's remember them. Let's champion their cause. Let's use these times to honor each other, to love each other, be supportive. You may not have the right words, but you can heal together. Don't rush yourself through your grieving. Take your time, be patient. If you feel overwhelmed, reach out for help because there are people who are empathetic, willing, non-judgmental and confidential to help you process your grief, whether it's a BVI HSA, community mental health, here at the wellness center, pastors, anyone, just reach out. It might be a friend who could just hold you. Don't suffer in silence. We love you. Well, thank you on behalf of the Wellness Center, my family, and, and for allowing this moment for us to be here. We will thrive together, Kathy. 
and we'll be we strong. definitely will we definitely will we are a strong people uh you they they say that it's the strongest that gets the biggest battle and uh, so we we are facing really big battles and you know yes it brings us to our knees sometimes in tears uh <laughs> let, let the tears flow if it has to but you know we have to get past it and you know move on and for us to move on it takes a togetherness and that is why i love i very much so love the family of Rotary, not only the Rotary Club of Tertola, Yes, we are the sponsors of this very great initiative, and it's just uh, the second in a series uh, that we're going to be carrying live. Uh, but the family of Rotary in the British Virgin Islands, the family of Rotary in the District 7020, the family of Rotary International, and that those are collaborated with other social organizations that are doing si uh, similar or even different things with all with the objective of us uh, being a shoulder for each other to, to rest on. We love the Red Cross. We love the Family Support Network. We love the Lions. We love the Rotoractors. We love the Interactors. There are so many organizations throughout our territory that are doing different things. And if you think that you know there is some way or the other that you can tap into any of the resources please do not fail to do so. If you are on this life and you know of a friend who may well need to hear this, but they weren't on tonight, feel free to share, share, share. Even if you have to cut a clip that you think that is uh, appealing to that particular person and their situation, just screen grab that clip and send it to them. Uh, otherwise, share numbers, you know, reach out, reach out. Just let your heart pour out with love. I want to again say thank you so much for the, to the Rotary family of the Rotary Club of Tertola and all our supporting arms around. I want to thank so much JTV. I want to thank so much 284 Media. I want to thank so much Flo. I want to thank so much Z King Radio. Uh, this is what community is all about. And with the time being on us tonight, I want to say so much thanks and have a good evening. Thank you for sharing these moments with us here on the, this a very special production produced by the Rotary Club of Tertola. On behalf of our entire family, I'm Kathy Richards saying have a great rest of your night. God bless.